Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. This is part two of our episode on Ernest Shackleton's expeditions to Antarctica. I would only recommend starting with this one if you really like your stories to just start in medias res, because where we left off, Shackleton had traveled to Antarctica aboard the Endurance, and he was trapped there on the ice. The team had abandoned ship. Another team that we have not talked about much at all had also traveled to Antarctica. They were aboard the Aurora, and their job was to lay the supply depots that Shackleton's party was going to need on the second half of their trip across the continent. We will be catching up with the Aurora again later. First, we will talk about the extraordinary survival of Shackleton's team. If you missed last time, also, uh, there are some deaths in this episode, including some animal deaths. Losing the endurance meant that there was no way Ernest Shackleton's team could attempt to trek across Antarctica. A six-person team was supposed to be making that crossing, not all of the 28 people who were with him. Aside from that, the ice pack had been drifting the whole time the Endurance was stuck, so they were about 570 miles from where they had first become trapped. They had been moving in a roughly northwesterly direction toward the Antarctic Peninsula. So their new plan was to cross the ice until they got to water and then make for one of the islands at the end of that peninsula by boat. Shackleton thought Paulet Island was a good bet. It had shelter and supplies that were left by an earlier expedition. And that was roughly 350 miles away. The team camped on an ice floe about 100 yards from the wrecked ship, and they salvaged as much as they could from the wreckage. They called this spot where they were basically dropping stuff off their dump camp. And their preparations to leave that camp involved some difficult decisions. Shackleton wrote in his journal, quote, This afternoon, Sally's three youngest pups, Sue's Sirius and Mrs. Chippy the Carpenter's Cat, have to be shot. We could not undertake the maintenance of weaklings under the new conditions. Macklin, Crane, and the Carpenter seem to feel the loss of their friends rather badly. This wasn't the first time that dogs had to be shot during this. Uh, In other cases, though, the dogs had been really sick or hurt. The expedition was supposed to have a dog handler. The dog handler was supposed to have deworming medicine, but he didn't wind up joining the expedition, and they lost a lot of dogs because of intestinal worms. They also needed to cut down what they were carrying as much as possible. Everyone was allowed only two pounds of personal possessions, with a few exceptions. Leonard Hussey was allowed to bring his banjo for the sake of everyone's morale. Shackleton set the example himself, discarding his watch, his silver brushes, and other personal items in front of the rest of the crew. This included a Bible that Queen Alexandra had given him before departing. He pulled some passages from it first, though. One was the 23rd Psalm, which begins, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He also kept part of chapter 38 from the book of Job, out of whose womb came the ice and the hoary frost of heaven who hath gendered it. The waters are hid as with a stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. Shackleton and photographer Frank Hurley also had to make decisions about the expedition's pictures and film. Hurley had already braved the ship's wreckage while it was taking on water, and he had gotten everything he could get out of the darkroom. But now they had to decide what to keep and what they were going to have to leave behind, keeping in mind that the advanced sale of his work had helped pay for the expedition. Hurley wound up leaving most of his glass negatives along with a lot of his equipment, but keeping film and a book of printed photographs. We have mentioned Shackleton's efforts to minimize divisions and foster a sense that things were being handled equitably. That was the case in these preparations as well. For example, they had two types of sleeping bags. Some were made of reindeer fur and they were much warmer, and the others were made of wool. Although lots were drawn to decide who got which one, many of the higher-ranking men stayed out of it. They took a wool bag for themselves and they left the better bags for everyone else. Shackleton knew that crossing the ice was going to be difficult, so he sent an advance party to try to clear a path. This path would need to accommodate dogs and sledges and men who were hauling the Endurance's three lifeboats. 
but soon it became obvious that this was just not going to work. The ice was far too uneven and irregular. The boats probably would not even be seaworthy by the end of it if they got dragged over all that. So Shackleton revised his plan again, this time to continue drifting along with the ice and to wait for it to break up, hopefully with them being close enough to Paulette Island to make it there in the boats. They established a new camp, which they called Ocean Camp, about a mile and a half away from the wreck of the Endurance. Shackleton kept working on morale, including assigning the men who were hard to get along with to the same tent, which was also where he slept. He had really tried to select people for this expedition based on their skills and their temperament, but even so, this kind of stress and isolation and months of unending darkness were really hard. He also eventually had quartermaster Thomas Ord Lees sleep with stores instead of in a tent with others. He was generally anxious and very focused on how short they were on everything and how much more likely that made it that they would all die. His journal has stuff in it where it's like he almost grasps that his demeanor was upsetting people Uh, Because he would say things like, Shackleton seems to understand that we might not live, but he doesn't want us to talk about it because it might upset the sailors. And I'm like, dude, (laughs) you need to rein it in a little bit. The weather continued to warm as summer progressed into November, but in some ways that made things worse on the ice flow. Everything became slushy and gross. People could just never get dry And yet the ice flow was not breaking up in the way that they hoped it would. On November 21st, 1915, the Endurance sank. Shackleton noted in his journal, quote, At 5 p.m., she went down by the head. The stern, the cause of all the trouble, was the last to go underwater. I cannot write about it. After this, tensions started to flare. Teams kept going back to the dump camp to bring back more stuff that they could salvage from it, but that became increasingly dangerous. Shackleton started having trouble with sciatica, and for a while he was in so much pain that he could not get out of his sleeping bag without help. That made it hard for him to stay connected with what was happening with the rest of the camp and head off any morale issues that were brewing. With the ice flow staying stubbornly intact, but the ice itself seeming a little more passable, Shackleton decided to try hauling the boats to open water again. The ship had three small boats named after their biggest financial backers, the Stancombe Wills, the Dudley Docker, and the James Caird. They planned to have a Christmas celebration on Midsummer Day, December 22nd, and then set out the day after that, hauling the Dudley Docker and the James Caird and leaving the Stancombe Wills behind. When they tried to do this, the going was very, very slow. Shackleton had hoped to pull the boats about 60 miles, but it was immediately clear that they were never, ever going to make it that far. People's nerves started to fray as they were second-guessing of whether leaving Ocean Camp had been the right decision. Eventually, they hit an impassable stretch of ice and they had to backtrack, only for a crack to open up where they had been trying to make camp. People were understandably deeply frustrated that they'd left behind a lot of gear and supplies, and now they were in a worse position than they had been before, having made really almost no progress. They established yet another new camp, this one called Patience Camp. By mid-January, the food supply was low enough that it could not sustain both the men and the dogs, and all but two of the sled teams were shot. Both Shackleton and second-in-command Frank Wilde wrote that this was the worst job of their lives. Shortly after this, the two remaining sledge teams made a run back to Ocean Camp, and they came back with about 900 pounds of stores. Then they sent another team to retrieve the Stancombe Wills. They were still low on food, and they were low on blubber to be used as fuel, but Shackleton resisted sending people out on hunting expeditions, It's not totally clear why. He had really shown plenty of willingness to change his decisions in the face of changing circumstances or new information. But in this case, he just kept maintaining that they had plenty. A lot of people felt like they did not have plenty. Some of the men who were keeping journals through this period became increasingly frustrated and cynical in them. By March, they were about 70 miles from Paulette Island, and they could feel the movement of the ocean under the ice. 
they kept themselves ready to move quickly if the ice flow finally broke in a way that let them get to open water. Instead, when they finally passed Paulette Island, they were still separated by far too much ice to cross. The island was about 60 miles away, but in Shackleton's words, quote, it might have been 600 for all the chance that we had of reaching it by sledging across the broken sea ice in its present condition. On March 30th, the team had to shoot the last of the dogs, and they ate meat from some of the younger ones. By this point, their diet was almost entirely meat, although most of it was from seals and seabirds. In April, their ice flow started moving very quickly, caught in strong currents, and it was heaving enough that some of the men got seasick. One night, a crack opened directly under a tent where two men were sleeping, and Shackleton rescued fireman Ernest Holness by pulling him out of the water by his sleeping bag. At this point, they could see Elephant Island in the distance, and they were finally close enough to water that they could get the boats there. So they abandoned the ice flow on April 9th. We'll talk more about what happened after a sponsor break. Once Shackleton and his men were in the lifeboats, things became even more difficult and dangerous than they had been back on the ice. The largest of the boats was only about 22 feet or 6.7 meters long. They were facing gale force winds and rough seas that sometimes pushed them in the totally wrong direction or they blew the boats away from each other. They were also surrounded by huge treacherous chunks of ice and a whole lot of orca. The men had also been on an almost all-meat diet for so long that their bodies just had almost no energy to do anything. They were at sea for four days, sheltering in the lee of large ice chunks overnight. By the third day, morale was pretty much broken. They were all completely exhausted. All of the boats had been swamped, so the men's feet were soaking in freezing water. Some tried to row or get out of the way of ice, while others tried to bail out the boats. But everyone was dehydrated. Many of them had seasickness or dysentery or both. Shackleton reportedly stayed awake the whole time. They finally reached Elephant Island on April 15th, 1916, and they had hot food and drink for the first time in days. But the spot where they made landfall was far from ideal. They had almost no shelter from the elements or the tides. A lot of the men had frostbite. Percy Blackborough, who had originally been a stowaway, was seriously ill. And first engineer Lewis Rickinson also appeared to have had a heart attack. A scouting team went to look for a better camping spot by boat, and they found an area with a little more space and shelter. They relocated the camp by boat, but they had to leave some of their supplies behind because they were simply too exhausted to move them. This new location, though, was still fairly exposed. A blizzard ripped up one of their tents and flattened others almost immediately. And it was also a penguin rookery just covered in guano. Shackleton's description of the state of things at this point comes off as a little judgmental, especially given current understanding of things like trauma and mental health. Quote, Some of the men were showing signs of demoralization. They were disinclined to leave the tents when the hour came for turning out, and it was apparent they were thinking more of the discomforts of the moment than of the good fortune that had brought us to sound ground and comparative safety. The condition of the gloves and headgear shown me by some discouraged men illustrated the proverbial carelessness of the sailor, The articles had frozen stiff during the night, and the owners considered, it appeared, that this state of affairs provided them with a grievance, or at any rate gave them the right to grumble. They said they wanted dry clothes and that their health would not admit of their doing any work. Only by rather drastic methods were they induced to turn to. Frozen gloves and helmets undoubtedly are very uncomfortable, and the proper thing is to keep these articles thawed by placing them inside one's shirt during the night. In addition to its shortcomings in terms of protection from the elements and so much bird poop, the camp on Elephant Island wasn't near any kind of shipping lane, so there was just about no chance that the men would be spotted and rescued. So Shackleton announced that he and a crew would take the James Caird, which was the biggest of the lifeboats, to South Georgia Island to get help. 
South Georgia Island was roughly 800 miles away. They spent the next few days making repairs and adjustments to the James Caird, both to repair some damage and to make it at least slightly more suitable for the journey. They salvaged lumber to make it more seaworthy, and they made a makeshift decking out of canvas that they had to thaw out in sections before they could sew it together. They made ballast for the boat by filling blankets with shingle from the island, and they supplemented that with boulders. Shackleton chose five other men to accompany him. Frank Worsley, captain of the Endurance, second officer Thomas Crane, Carpenter Henry McNish, and seaman Timothy McCarthy and John Vincent. He selected these men both for their skills and for their attitudes, although not necessarily because he thought that they would be pleasant to have along. McNish, for example, was a highly skilled carpenter, but he also butted heads with Shackleton and other authority figures. And he may have been selected just out of fear that he would cause unrest among the men if he were left at Elephant Island. They left on April 24th, both to take advantage of a break in the weather and to try to get ahead of a band of ice that was freezing along the coast. They rode the James Caird out past the reef while other men ferried their food and equipment to them aboard the Stancomb Wills. Hurley was taking photos of all of this. He had done that the whole time they were on the ice. He would continue to take photos on Elephant Island. One of his most dramatic ones shows the James Caird as it was leaving. This photograph originally also showed the Stancomb Wills coming back from its last ferry run, but the Stancomb Wills was scratched out of the negative to show only the James Caird. Shackleton left his second-in-command, Frank Wilde, in charge of the camp, giving him a letter that started, quote, In the event of my not surviving the boat journey to South Georgia, you will do your best for the rescue of the party. Wilde tried to carry on Shackleton's efforts of focusing on the men's morale. In his own account, one of the more pessimistic men said, quote, that's the last of them, as the James Caird sailed away, and, quote, I almost knocked him down with a rock, but satisfied myself by addressing a few remarks to him in real lower deck language. The men left behind on Elephant Island made more durable shelters out of the boats and whatever else they could salvage. But the first night, they were buried in a blizzard that revealed a lot of cracks in their shelters. They stuffed those up with a torn-up sleeping bag. Every day, they would stow their equipment so that they would be ready to leave if rescue arrived. They also tried to divide up the little pleasures they had access to, like rotating through the closest seat to the stove at mealtime so everyone had a turn. They were still eating almost nothing but meat, but every once in a while, Wild would break out some kind of treat from their stores, like barley or jam. They also still had Hussey's banjo, and they made up various songs about the predicament they were in. But as the days got shorter and shorter, the men spent more and more time in their sleeping bags. A lot of them became increasingly ill, and some had injuries that were truly dire. Blackborough, for example, developed gangrene in his feet, and that forced the surgeon to amputate his toes in a makeshift operating room that was as clean as they could make it. But considering that they were on an island covered in bird poop working with gear that had been repeatedly swamped by the ocean, was not that clean. Uh, meanwhile, conditions aboard the James Caird were terrible. In Shackleton's words, quote, the tale of the next 16 days is one of supreme strife amid heaving waters. The stretch of ocean they needed to cross was notoriously stormy. At one point, they were nearly capsized by a wave so big that Shackleton mistook its foamy crest for a break in the clouds with light shining through. Their reindeer skin sleeping bags started to shed, so there were prickly hairs all over the inside of the boat. The men had to sit or lie on the rocky, waterlogged ballast. They were increasingly wet, frostbitten, and burned from their stove. Worsley wrote of their situation and Shackleton's behavior, quote, two of the party at least were very close to death. Indeed, it might be said that he kept a finger on each man's pulse, Whenever he noticed that a man seemed extra cold and shivered, he would immediately order another drink of hot milk to be prepared and served to all. He never let the man know it was on his account, lest he become nervous about himself. On May 4th, they had a break in the weather, so they were able to get a little bit of a break and dry some of their clothes and sleeping bags. But there was so much cloud cover that they couldn't accurately determine their position. 
Their first real indicator that they were getting closer to land was on May 7th when they spotted some kelp. They ran out of fresh water before they got to the reef that ran alongside South Georgia Island, and then it took them multiple tries to get over the reef. By the time they finally made landfall, they were too tired to drag the boat out of the surf. They had to take turns hanging on to it so they wouldn't lose it, and they nearly did lose it at one point during the night. In the morning, they ate some fledgling albatrosses, something that might seem weird if you have read The Rime of the Ancient Mariner, but really it was not all that unusual. In fact, someone on the Endurance had a copy of that poem, and they had used it to entertain themselves while trapped on the ice. In Shackleton's words, quote, On reading the latter, we sympathized with him and wondered what he had done with the albatross. It would have made a very welcome addition to our larder. Although they had gotten to South Georgia Island, they were basically on the wrong side of it. To get to the whaling station at Gritvikin, they were going to have to cross over the island, which was mountainous, uncharted, and considered to be uninhabitable. They also had no mountaineering equipment, just a rope and a carpenter's ads. If they were going in a straight line, they would need to travel 22 miles or 35 kilometers, but this obviously was not going to be a remotely straight line. It took a few days for them to recover, work out their gear, and prepare to leave. McNeish and Vincent were too sick to make the journey, so McCarthy stayed behind with them in a hut that they made from the boat, while Shackleton, Worsley, and Crane crossed the island. They got very little rest along the way. They did not have a tent or sleeping bags with them, and if they had fallen asleep for any length of time, they probably would have died. Then at one point, they got to a mountain face that they didn't have a way to get down, and so they had to slide down it on their coiled-up rope. Having done all that, after about 36 hours, they made it to the whaling station just ahead of a gale that probably would have killed them if they had taken any longer. Shackleton gave this description of his meeting with Mr. Sorrel, manager of the whaling station, after they had crossed the mountains. Don't you know me, I said. I know your voice, he replied doubtfully. You're the mate of the daisy. My name is Shackleton, I said. Immediately, he put out his hand and said, come in, come in. Tell me, when was the war over, I asked. The war is not over, he answered. Millions are being killed. Europe is mad. The world is mad. Good, so what happened next after another quick sponsor break? After Shackleton, Worsley, and Crane ate and recovered a little bit, Worsley went with a relief boat to get the three men that they had left on the other side of the island. Those three were sent back to England, while Shackleton, Worsley, and Crane started trying to find a ship that could rescue the 22 people who were still left on Elephant Island. This turned out to be difficult. It was winter, and as Shackleton had just learned, the world was still at war. First, they tried aboard the Southern Sky, which could not make it through the pack ice. The Southern Sky took Shackleton to the Falkland Islands, where he was able to send a cable to Britain to let everyone know he had survived. While people were pleased to hear that, they were also really preoccupied with the ongoing war. Shackleton was advised to seek help from nations in South America to relieve his stranded crew. This still took a while. He faced a whole series of breakdowns and ice jams and other disappointments before finally getting to Elephant Island aboard the Chilean steamer Yelcho. This was a small boat. It was not at all built for this kind of purpose. They arrived at Elephant Island on August 30th, 1916. Shackleton was on deck looking through binoculars, alarmed to see what looked like a flag at half-staff but then he saw that there were 22 men present on shore. In Worsley's words, quote, he put his glasses back in their case and turned to me, his face showing more emotion than I had ever known it to show before. Crane had joined us and we were all unable to speak. It sounds trite, but years literally seemed to drop from him as he stood before us. From Wilde's point of view, I'm seeing the ship from the island, quote, I felt jolly near blubbing for a bit and could not speak for several minutes. The survival of all 28 men from Shackleton's expedition aboard the Endurance was truly astonishing, and it made headlines. But World War I had stretched on the whole time they had been gone. 
It had been so painful and demoralizing that people didn't really see this dramatic rescue as much of a relief. There was even some criticism that everyone involved should have been part of the war effort that whole time they were gone. Also, this relief of the men at Elephant Island was not the end of the saga for the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition or Shackleton's efforts to get all of his men to safety. As the Endurance was trapped in the sea ice in the Weddell Sea, the Ross Sea Party had been facing its own ordeal. If you recall, that was the party that had arrived on the Aurora to lay the supply depots that Shackleton's team would need. The Ross Sea Party was under the command of Aeneas McIntosh, who had been part of Shackleton's expedition aboard the Nimrod and had lost an eye in an accident during that expedition. Others also had experience in Antarctica, but many of the crew aboard did not have any polar experience. Their money and supplies were even more hectically cobbled together than the endurance teams was. And they were also operating under a totally unnecessary deadline. Shackleton had originally hoped to cross Antarctica in the summer of 1914 and 1915, and he had realized that was not going to work before setting sail from South Georgia Island. But before he left, he did not send any kind of word to McIntosh about the schedule change. On top of that, once Shackleton realized their crossing wasn't going to happen at all, there was no way to let McIntosh know. So the Ross Sea Party, number one, was trying to plan for an expedition that was running a year late, and then number two had no idea that Shackleton's team wasn't coming, but they thought if they didn't get their job done, Shackleton was going to die. The Ross Sea Party had arrived at McMurdo Sound in January of 1915 and started laying supply depots on January 28th, but that was extremely slow going. They faced deep snow and impassable ice ridges. Their sledges were overloaded, and eventually they had to divide the supplies and carry them in a relay. This took four times as long, and they had to travel four times as far. So soon, they were exhausted, and they were low on rations. The sledge dogs became so hungry that they started trying to eat their own harnesses, and as the dogs died, the men had to haul more and more of the load themselves. To add to all of that, there were blizzards, extremely low temperatures, frostbite, snow blindness, and sleeping bags that froze solid during the day and then melted when they were exposed to people's body heat at night, so the team was just constantly cold and wet. Eventually, McIntosh and the sledge teams had to return to the base for the winter. They got there on March 25th to find the Aurora and almost all of the rest of the shore team gone. They took shelter in a hut that Robert Falcon Scott had left behind in 1902 and then waited for the McMurdo Sound to freeze over so they could walk to their planned winter quarters on Cape Evans. There, they found the rest of the shore party, but the Aurora was gone. It had been blown off its moorings in a gale and everyone assumed it had sunk. Most of what was supposed to sustain the shore team over the winter had not yet been unloaded when the Aurora disappeared, including their winter clothes. They had only what they were wearing. Yeah, Robert Falcon Scott could not object to their use of that hut because at this point he had died trying to return from the South Pole. The Aurora team made it through the winter, though. And as the weather got warmer in October of 1915, they got back to work, now with makeshift gear and sledges and with only nine men and four surviving dogs to do the work. And this phase was even worse than the first one. They started out with three teams, and each team had its own stove. But when one of the stoves failed, that team had to go back to base. Then the second stove failed, so the two remaining teams had to consolidate and move together. That slowed their progress way, way down. They again faced scurvy and snow blindness and hunger, reaching a point where each man's daily ration was eight lumps of sugar and a biscuit. Arnold Spencer Smith became so ill he had to be left behind, and when the team returned for him, both he and McIntosh had to be loaded onto sledges and pulled. On their journey home, their situation was so dire that they were living on tea and dog food and having to take supplies from the depots that were supposed to be for Shackleton. Again, not knowing that Shackleton was not coming and thinking that if they took too much, his party would be doomed. 
Arnold Spencer Smith died of scurvy on March 8th. And as the team was trying to make their journey back to the base, McIntosh became so weak that he could not even stay on the sledge he was being pulled on. More than once, he fell off, and the team had to backtrack for him after they realized he was gone. The surviving team made it back to Hut Point, and in May, McIntosh announced that he and V.G. Hayward were going to walk across the ice to the base camp at Cape Evans. The rest of the team tried to dissuade them, thinking that the ice was not deep enough to be safe yet. McIntosh and Hayward left anyway, and a blizzard started not long after. A search party went to look for them once the storm had cleared and found their trail of footprints, which stopped suddenly at some freshly frozen ice. Eventually, the last of the sledging party crossed back to Cape Evans and met up with the rest of the team that had stayed there. Once authorities knew about Shackleton's survival, funds were finally approved for a relief expedition for the Ross Sea Party. Shackleton left for New Zealand in October of 1916 to join that party, and the ship sent to retrieve them was the Aurora. Now it was under the command of Captain John King Davis. Unbeknownst to anybody who had been on the shore, The Aurora, after getting blown off its moorings, had spent 10 months drifting in the pack ice and then had gone to New Zealand for repairs once it was freed. The Aurora arrived in Antarctica on January 10, 1917, and Shackleton learned about the deaths of McIntosh, Hayward, and Spencer Smith, and the fact that the party had traveled 1,500 miles in 160 days, laying their supply depots as planned. They looked for the bodies of McIntosh and Hayward and took the seven men who had been stranded ashore back to New Zealand. Yeah, there was no sign of their bodies. They almost certainly fell through the ice or were on an ice floe that broke away and they couldn't get off of it. Shackleton again worked with Edward Saunders to write a book about all of this. It was titled South, The Story of Shackleton's Last Expedition, 1914 to 1917. This is in the public domain now, along with a lot of his other work. You can read it online for free. Just one note, if you do this, one of the Ross Sea Party's sledge dogs is named a racist slur. Most of the men who had survived this expedition went into active service during the remainder of World War I. But Shackleton had trouble finding a post. He seems to have struggled during this time, drinking excessively and spending most of his time with a woman that he was having an affair with. The Foreign Office sent him to South America in late 1917 and 1918 on what was described as a propaganda mission to raise morale. He went to Russia with the British Expeditionary Force in 1919. That same year, Frank Hurley released a silent film called South, Ernest Shackleton and the Endurance Expedition. After the war was over, Shackleton tried to plan another expedition to Antarctica, this one aboard a ship called The Quest, It had a crew of 18, seven of whom had been aboard the Endurance. They arrived at Gritviken Harbor on South Georgia Island on January 4, 1922. The next day, Shackleton died of a heart attack at the age of 47. Many sources attribute this to damage from the extreme stress and difficulty of the Endurance expedition. Although plans were made to return Shackleton's body to his wife, at her request, he was buried in a cemetery on a hill above the whaling station at South Georgia Island. His obituary in the geographical record began, quote, with the death of Sir Ernest Shackleton, Britain loses one of the most brilliant explorers of modern days. And in his 1923 book, The Worst Journey in the World, about Robert Falcon Scott's ill-fated 1910 expedition to the South Pole, Apsley Cherry Garrard wrote, quote, For a joint scientific and geographical piece of organization, give me Scott. For a winter journey, Wilson. For a dash to the pole and nothing else, Amundsen. And if I am in the devil of a hole and want to get out of it, give me Shackleton every time. And of course, the Falkland Maritime Heritage Trust's Endurance 22 expedition found the Endurance on March 9, 2022, using remotely operated submarines. It was in water 1,645 fathoms, or 3,008 meters deep, about six kilometers from where Frank Worsley had recorded the ship's last position. It's reportedly in surprisingly good condition, considering the circumstances of its sinking and the conditions of the Weddell Sea, 
and really full of all kinds of fascinating sea life. Yeah, there's a crab in particular that got a lot of attention. <laughs> having a big time. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's that's Shackleton's endurance now that the shipwreck has been found. We'll talk. We have various feelings about of all this, about all of this, and we will talk about them in the behind the scenes. Uh, and I have listener mail from Celeste, who writes, Dear Holly and Tracy, I love your podcast. I am constantly entertaining friends and family with the things I learn there. I've been meaning to share this for quite some time, and your recent podcast on William Apis reminded me to do so. I'm the director of the Cumberland Public Library in Rhode Island. My library is a former monastery situated on 550 acres. There are a number of trails here, but one of them leads to a monument called Nine Men's Misery. It is said to be the oldest veterans memorial in the country. I have attached a document created by a long-ago Eagle Scout that details the history of King Philip's War and how the monument came to be there. Ten men were dispatched from a regiment during a skirmish called Pierce's Fight, where 52 soldiers and 11 Native Americans died. These ten were supposedly ambushed by Native Americans and only one survived. Their bodies were buried in a mass grave here on the future monastery grounds and a cairn built over them. When the monks came here in the early 1900s, they built a better cairn cemented together, which you can see today. Later in 1976, a veterans group placed a marker there. Needless to say, local residents believe it's haunted and that one can hear groans coming from the earth. I've walked there many times and haven't heard anything, but you never know. Keep up the wonderful podcast. I'm attaching a photo of my rescue, Sadie, who is an Australian cattle dog, Celeste. Thanks so much for sending this, Celeste. Number one, kind of cool to have a public library that is in a former monastery site. I find that very interesting. Mm-hmm. I also, having done, uh, you know, episodes about King Philip's War um, a couple of different times, uh, I had never heard about this particular fight, um, at which, of course, is its own very complicated story beyond the context of just this email. Um, also, what a good dog. <laughs> Uh, so thank you again Celeste for sending this email if you would like to send us a note we're at historypodcast at iheartradio.com and we're all over social media at Missed in History that's where you'll find our Facebook Twitter Pinterest and Instagram and you can subscribe to our show on the uh, iHeartRadio app and wherever else you like to get your podcasts Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.